It's been a cool spring here, so everything's really far behind. But here on Red Roof Family Farm in Kelowna, British Columbia, Canada, things are about to explode. We sell flowers and veggies down at the farmer's market and here at our roadside stand, and the flowers are just getting started. We need to start our farm tour in the most beautiful spot on the entire property, which is inside of our greenhouse that has the ranunculus planted. They have started to bloom and swoon. These are my absolute favorite flowers. We grew them for the first time last year and we loved them so much that we went from growing 300 to this year having 1500 planted, including 500 just in this greenhouse here. And we don't have enough. Our greenhouse space is our most valuable, most precious space on the farm. And so the ranunculus that I chose to plant in here are all the bright, vibrant colored ones because these, these are my favorite. This I'm standing in front of, the orange, I'm, I'm so happy with these. Seeing these finally open up, they're everything I wanted them to be and more. We didn't have orange last year, but we had this bright yellow color and we just couldn't get enough of it. You know, it was like, oh, yellow, oh my God, so good. And when I saw other people having this orange tone online, I, I knew I had to have it. So, oh, this section, it just, it makes me so happy. But in here, not only do we have the yellow and the orange, we also have like a crimson red and we have a bright, bright pink and this rich, deep purpley violet color. Um, these, these are all of my favorites. This greenhouse is really exciting right now with all of the ranunculus in it, but this is always going to be an exciting greenhouse because in here we also have two beds of lisianthus. I think I have like, 1500 I think there's like 700 in each of these beds we, we bought a crazy amount and when the summer comes and these start growing and flowering it's gonna be pretty incredible Lisianthus drives me absolutely crazy last year I bought a hundred dollars in seeds and I was able to grow zero flowers <laughs> this year we spent a thousand dollars on all of these plugs we spent a lot of money um, and they've been in the ground for like close to two months now. They've been in here for a very long time. They're finally starting to grow a little bit, um, but these, they're so slow growing. These, you know, we bought them, already started as plants. They came, we planted them in end of March. And, you know, we're talking about these are gonna be picked in like August, September. So this is a very, very slow growing plant, but the flowers, 
incredible and decadent. So hopefully they end up being worth the effort. I could spend all day in here obsessing, but let's move on to the rest of the farm. We don't have just one greenhouse filled with flowers. We actually have two. And this greenhouse is a lot of my cooler, um, cooler loving flowers, the stuff that's going to bloom the absolute earliest. And I've been desperately watching it because I need flowers. If I don't have flowers ready, I don't have flowers to sell. And these are kind of the first things that are going to be ready. And there hasn't been anything so far. So, but it, the, it's starting. It's finally starting. I think next week I'll be doing my first picking in here. And within a month from now, this is going to be so abundant. So many stems coming out of here every single day. Probably my favorite bed in this greenhouse is this entire bed of snapdragons. These are all an earlier blooming snapdragon variety. I either have Costa or Chantilly in here. And I think I planted like seven or 800 snapdragons in this single 50 foot bed. I don't normally plant them this tight, but I figured it's worth the experiment. You know, I really wanted to see how many stems I could get out of this tiny little space. Most of these I pinched and that kind of sets them back by a couple weeks, but it means that you get many flowers from a single plant instead of just one stem. Um, and despite that, they're coming, they're getting close. You know, a few here are starting to bud up. There's a lot that are starting to get some length. It isn't going to be long until these are ready. I wouldn't be surprised if in two or three weeks I'm going to have lots of snapdragons that I'm going to be able to sell at our market. Another little experiment that I'm really excited about is I had some leftover anemones. Most of my anemones I planted out in my field, but I had about 50 left and nowhere to put them. So I stuck them into this little corner where my snapdragons had finished off. It was just empty space and I'm so glad I did because these anemones in here are very long, very happy and very beautiful. These are going to be really easy for me to use in my bouquets, whereas the anemones that I have out in the field are still very short. There's something about the sheltered from the wind, the filtered light that's making these grow really tall and really beautiful. And these are also a plant that here I could plant in the fall in a greenhouse. So I'm really excited for experiments I can do with these into the future. These could be a very valuable plant for me. In the center bed of this greenhouse, I have a bunch of overwintering experiments that I did. Last year I did some overwintering experiments on annuals and they did fairly good. You know, things like snapdragons could overwinter, but this last winter I wanted to do some overwintering experiments on perennials. So this right here is feverfew. Feverfew for me doesn't overwinter very well. There's something about our conditions that even though our winters don't get so cold, it just can't really make it. And I was wondering if in the greenhouse it could, and I mean, clearly, clearly it did. I have this beautiful crop of feverfew. The other thing that's really exciting for me is I love feverfew. I want to put feverfew in every single bouquet I ever make. But you know, my window for when it's ready, I only have about six weeks that I can get out of the field. By growing a patch of feverfew in the greenhouse, this feverfew is gonna be ready a month earlier than my field grown feverfew. That means that now I have 10 weeks of feverfew and that has me very happy. My next overwintering experiment was Dara's and Amy's. Um, and you can see, I kind of have a few different plants in here. And that's because this experiment wasn't as successful. A few of them survived but uh, most of them died. So in here, I've also interplanted with some stock plants. I've never grown stock before, so this is a little experiment that I'm doing. Um, but yeah, the Dara and the Ami, you know, it almost would have done better out in the field. I have it over winter really well out there. So I, I don't know what it was about the greenhouse that it didn't like. I also had really inconsistent results on Rubecchia. Yet again, this is one that, you know, did quite well out in the field. So I don't know why only half of them made it in here. I think it has to do with the fact that it's just a little bit drier in the greenhouse. But yeah, so, you know, little patchy on surviving the winter, but I mean, these are growing, these are budding, these are gonna be putting out stems. And yet again, they're gonna be exactly like the fever few. These plants growing in here are gonna produce way earlier than what I have out in the field. And then my final one is yarrow, which I'm obsessed with, I love. I can never have enough yarrow, so I'm really happy with how well this did. The yarrow in here, like, 
did incredible. Yarrow over winters for me, no problems. But the Yarrow in here, like, actually got like lush and full over the winter. It was really, it was really interesting to see how happy it was. And yet again, I think I'm gonna have my first stems of Yarrow being picked in here next week. And my Yarrow out in like my field area, probably three or four weeks off. And then the rest of this greenhouse is other little experiments. So I love sunflowers. If I could have sunflowers, I would be able to sell them. I am limited for when I can have sunflowers because sunflowers, you know, they need the heat. They, uh, they're not super frost tolerant, but I put a little patch in here to see how they do in the cool weather. If they weren't getting frozen or frosted because they're protected by the greenhouse, would they still grow? And, and they definitely have like these have, these have been unhappy. It took too long for me to transplant them out and they haven't been getting watered properly. And despite that, I think I'm gonna have cuttable stems off of these probably in three weeks, which is way earlier than anything in the field. I'm also trying an annual, not a biannual, uh, Sweet William for the first time. And these, when I planted them out, there were these tiny little plants and they sat in the ground for a month and didn't grow at all. So I had basically given up on them, but with a little bit more warmth, they finally started growing and there's a few, there's a few buds that are set up here that I wouldn't be surprised if I'm picking very soon. I have a patch of calendula in here, and this is a flower that isn't my favorite as a cut flower. Um, it does the best for me here in our hot, dry conditions earlier on in the spring, but no one really seems to want orange in the spring. It's a, it's a really hard sell, especially because the main thing I have to pair it with is white, and orange and white really just isn't a great color palette. But I'm doing an experiment. I have this little patch to see if I can get it just that little bit earlier. Maybe if I can get it really, really early, then it would sell well. Um, so, you know, we're, we're really close on these. I've been picking off the buds that are about this height because I need, I need some length. You know, something like this, a couple inches, it's useless for me. Um, so there's not a lot of color in here, but these have been blooming for three weeks already and they are getting close enough. Um, they are growing tall enough that I wouldn't be surprised if in a week or two I'm cutting off of this. And then finally, the rest of this bed is all Amis and Daras. And these, when I planted them out, they were super tiny. I actually started these because I had seen that my overwintered ones had had such little success. And I really wanted a lot of this to work with. So there is a million plants in here. I planted it so dense because I thought a bunch of them were gonna die. Um, and then they all ended up surviving and being very happy. And they're, they're throwing up, they're throwing up stems already so this this little section here could be super valuable for me i could end up picking you know thousand two thousand three thousand dollars worth of stems off of just this because once these daras and amis get going they produce and they produce and they produce we're up in our perennial section of the farm and uh, i've chosen to talk beside this incredible orange icelandic poppy this ended up overwintering and surviving. Um, unfortunately, its friends didn't. This entire section here was, was filled with Icelandic poppies and you know, there's only about four or five of them that survived. Um, but other than these Icelandic poppies, this perennial section of the farm has had really incredible success as we go into our second year with it planted. We've expanded the perennials a little bit on the outside edge here. This is like we're fighting against grass here and we planted 50 of these bleeding hearts, which I think are going to pair really nicely with this kind of edge. The bleeding hearts, they come up, they bloom, they look gorgeous, and then they go dormant into the summer. So I think that we'll have good success with these along here and you know, they're, they're a little short. There's not much that I can do for picking this year, but in the years to come, I'm gonna get, you know, hundreds and hundreds of stems early, early, early off of these plants. This section here was our fever few section last year, and you can see it's a little spotty. This is kind of to be expected. I was actually surprised as much of the fever few survived as it did. Normally we wouldn't have this much success, but I've come in here. This is a really good spot for fever few. It's a little bit shady, so it kind of staggers things. And I filled in all the holes that had dead plants with fresh new babies for this year so you know it's very fun to know that this will fill in really soon another plant that i grew last year in this section and 
I'm kind of borderline on it is Dusty Miller. Um, I planted even more than I had last year, but I, I had it at the very end of the season. It was frost tolerant. Its foliage looked really nice as a filler when I didn't really have anything else. So I was glad to have it, but it didn't really produce anything all year long. I think there's a good chance it's because I grew it poorly. So I'm gonna give it one more go. Um, and also it looks incredible dried. So we're, go we're gonna try it out. We're gonna see how it goes, but we might not grow it again next year. Fingers crossed we do better. This next bed that I have in here is greenery. Um, and you know, I was really impressed with the success I had of the stuff in here last year. I didn't, you know, yet again, I didn't expect it to overwinter, but most of it did and most of it's looking even better. This in front of me is oregano. It was a little short last year. I didn't really use it much. It's already looking like lush and healthy and tall. So I think that, you know, just having that little bit of more time and a little bit more growth on it means that this year I might end up using this. And then over on this side, you know, this plant I didn't pick until the very, very end of the season. This is a uh, Russian tarragon, which was supposed to be super tall, super abundant. Um, and it kind of uh, like didn't do much. It's already tall enough I could use this as a filler if I wanted. Um, I think I'm gonna be really glad to have these plants. In here I also have a few mints. This was a mountain mint which was short and useless <laughs> last year um, and yet again it's tall and it hasn't even started flowering yet. I think I'm gonna have a lot of use for this and this is another mint that I grew. Yet again it wasn't very tall, wasn't very useful. I'm already having enough height on it. I could cut it anytime I wanted. So I'm really, really excited to see these second year um, herb perennials that I'm growing as filler to see, you know, that maybe they weren't worth judging that first year. Maybe the second year is when I'm really gonna learn about them. I'm also really excited about what the sedum is doing this year. This is our second year with it. Last year, they put up these incredible stems. Each plant kind of had like two stems. The flowers were this big, which is kind of a problem. They're almost too big to use. Um, this year, instead of two or three big stems, it's broken up into like 20 smaller, more reasonable size stems. So I'm going to be able to get a lot more cuts off of this. And they're also going to be cuts that are a lot more usable. Um, the sedum, like it just goes and goes and goes. I had sedum stems that I cut at the end of the year that I had in my outbuilding in a bucket of water that I had forgotten. They got pushed behind of a chair and they actually rooted and stayed alive all winter long and were like, plant me out. Um, so, you know, these plants are just gonna keep going. And if I wanted more sedum than what I have here, I could propagate this, no problems. Did you plant them out? No, I didn't. <laughs> we'll start with this. I think an entire bed of sedum is a good start. We'll see, we'll see if we need more in the future. I'm beside my yellow yarrow, which I'm obsessed with. I love this one. The color was incredible and it was super tall. And this is one of the first ones to bloom. And I'm excited to see it budding up already. But yet again, like all the yarrows, they're, they're really happy on this second year. Yarrow grows really, really well here. In fact, this entire row after this section is a white weed yarrow that was growing in our lawn that we transplanted into here because I love the white yarrow so much. Um, so, you know, having these two entire beds of yarrow, last year we picked and picked and picked. We had like two and a half months of yarrow that we were using um, and we used most of the stems. So I'm, I'm very happy to see it looking healthy and lush and, you know, offering me even more stems this year than last year. And then this little corner is the end of my, you know, newer perennials. and. Yet again, the story continues. I'm very happy with the success. This Baptisia in here, I actually thought that it had died. I thought I killed it. It, by the, by the end of the summer, it had crisped up. It had completely died off. I thought, you know, I wasn't watering it as much as it needed. It was gone. And here it is, it's come back. It has buds on it. You know, it's, it's a lot healthier, a lot happier than it was last year. And then over on this side, we have this perennial sunflower. I bought this last year thinking it probably wasn't going to be perennial here. I figured it would probably die off in the winter, but it was fun and oh my God, it was incredible to have. We used so much of it last year. So when it started growing again, I was so happy and it's actually growing so much. I've had to slit 
a landscape fabric. These, you know, the clumps, they started out this big last year. They're like this big this year. This plant is a beast. This could be a total invasive weed, which is exactly what I look for in a perennial here where it's so hard to find stuff that can deal with our hot, dry conditions in the summer. So we're gonna have lots of this and I'm excited about it. This one's a money maker. Yeah, pure money. More plants that were sad and died on me last year that survived. This is my sea holly. And you know, I can definitely see the plants that probably like hadn't, hadn't looked very good last year compared to the ones that did. Um, but they're back, right? Most of the plants did survive and, you know, every year they get more drought tolerant, um, more established. Every year that I don't kill them, um, it means they're gonna ha come back even better next year. So I'm happy to see so much success. And then over on this side, this is a daisy. And, um, you know, I, lo I love these. These are super useful. And yet again, it didn't really do much last year. Now they're full, they're healthy, they're happy. They're gonna give us a ton of stems this summer. We were so happy and so excited about the success of all the perennials last year that we did another big perennial shop for this year. And this whole section of our farm has now become perennials too. So I have a whole mix of stuff in here. Unfortunately, a lot of this isn't looking like it's not necessarily gonna produce this year, unlike the things that we planted last year. Um, but lesson learned from how beautiful they look on second year, I know it's not gonna be long until we're picking, you know, thousands and thousands of stems out of this section. So we have phlox and we have bee balms and we have solidago. This is another whole bed of baptisia because you can never have too much baptisia. We have more yarrow. You never have enough yarrow. <laughs> this is mostly actually yellow and orange yarrows because we have so many of the pinks and the whites. Um, we needed a whole nother bed of these fancy ones. And then I started a bunch of perennial scabiosa. I have uh, more of the sea hollies. We have the larger sea hollies in the other farm. This is the little mini white and blue glitter variety. So I'm, I'm really excited. You know, I know it doesn't really look too exciting and too abundant right now but by summer it's going to be obvious what's going on in here and by next year it's going to be incredible it's easy to show you guys all the exciting parts of the farm we don't necessarily feature stuff like this very often but i figured you might appreciate uh this is a whole nother section of our farm and right now it's just a weedy mess. This is where we had the tulips. The plan for this section is we're actually gonna dig the tulips out of the ground, but we want the tulips to go dormant. So we want the foliage to die back and then we need to get in here. We need to completely dig this up. So we're probably not gonna plant anything in here until the summer. And then on the other side, we have something that really doesn't get shown very often um, because this isn't farm. This is just purely home garden. We have three whole beds of strawberries because the kids love strawberries. They come in here, they entertain themselves eating strawberries in the summer when they're like, we want a snack. We're like, go get it out of the strawberry patch. Um, this last year, we put it onto the landscape fabric because the strawberry patches just kept getting drowned out with the grass that we're dealing with here. And we haven't touched this. We haven't done any weeding. I don't even know that we've watered this and, and it really it really probably needs some water. Um, but it's, it's exciting to see that even though there is some weeds in here, there's some dandelions, there's some grass, it hasn't been overtaken. So, you know, the work that we did for ourselves in the past is really paying off with this this year. You showing off your belly? <laughs> you embarrassed him. <laughs> Here in our main farm is the two beds that I want to be the most excited about in the farm. Um, and unfortunately I can't be. This is where we have our other thousand of our 1500 ranunculus. And we've definitely learned a lesson about how much better they do in the greenhouse. These plants are a lot shorter. They're a lot more unhappy. I don't think we're going to get the same sort of production out of them. It's been a weird year here. When I say that it is really cold, I, like I mean it, we haven't planted our tomatoes yet and nothing grew. We planted things out in like the end of March and they kind of only just started growing a couple weeks ago. Um, so I'm, I'm hopeful that with a little bit of warmer weather, we're like stuck between a rock and a hard place with these ranunculus. Ranunculus doesn't like warm weather, so too warm and they'll just, they'll die off. 
um, but I'm hoping I'm hoping we'll get enough of this window that this will actually produce something because oh my god it could be amazing it could be incredible it could you know a thousand of these just like exploding that's that was my dream but we'll we'll see we'll see I'm not gonna go into detail about absolutely everything that we have planted down in the farm because as I said, it really isn't doing as much as I would hope it would be doing by this time of the year. You know, we have we have the entire farm planted. This entire area is is planted. It's filled with these cool flowers, things that, you know, should be happy, should be getting close to blooming, um, and it just, it's not. You know, we have feverfew, and we have rubecchia, and we have straw flowers, and status, and amobium, and, uh, <laughs> you know, the list goes on and on. We have so many things that we're experimenting with this year. <laughs> Even a few of the things that we've had incredible success with in past years, um, like our larkspur, this year is just so slow. By this time last year, I feel like the larkspur was, you know, had all this height to it. And, you know, this year I only just got to the point that I could kind of spot it from the weeds. And it's, it's consistent. It's not just our flowers, even in our veggies, you know, carrots. Normally we have carrots in June and like, I'm like, okay, well they germinated. They'll, they will grow eventually. Um, it's, it's just been, it's, it's been a, it's been a tricky year to grow in. The carrots are going to have old souls when we sell them. <laughs> yeah, we probably won't have carrots until July with the, the way things have been going. Things will eventually, you know, get to where they need to be though. It, like I said, this entire farm is filled, right? Like the, the stuff is growing, it's germinated, you know, it just needs the wet, some weather, needs some water and, you know, and it'll come on. And hopefully we won't transition from cold, 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 too cold to grow to too hot for these, you know, cool loving plants to actually, you know, give us any sort of harvest. And, you know, we still have our old reliables, like our overwintered chard. Won't be long till these are standing up, these incredibly weird and funky looking flower stems that we love using. Um, so, you know, there's, there's stuff growing, there's stuff to sell. Um, it's just, it's hard for us to say when things will be ready. As a farmer, I can't control the weather. All I can grow is what I plant and when. And crops like this make me feel like I'm still doing that right. This is an experiment for this year that I am really excited and really inspired by. This is crimson clover and this is used as a cover crop. In fact, this, this has been planted here since the fall. We planted this as a cover crop when our sunflowers finished, something to cover the ground, keep the weeds from filling in. But the plan all along wasn't for for it to keep the weeds down and get tilled in in the spring. The plan was for flowers. Clover is incredible. It's super drought tolerant. It doesn't mind, you know, some of the weird conditions that we have here in the Okanagan. It has a really good vase life, you know, and, and it's beautiful. I, I love the look of it. Um, I was really, really hoping that the crimson clover would survive the winter and do exactly what it's doing for me right now. I don't have very many fillers. This is that time of year when I don't really have very many options, but I have an entire bed of this. I have, you know, there's probably 10,000 stems of crimson clover in this entire single bed um, that was so easy for me to grow and it's easy for me to come in and harvest. It's maybe not as tall as some other fillers that I could use. It's maybe not something that I would be super excited about in the summer, but this is going to pair perfectly for all the ranunculus that I have coming out. And, you know, it's, it's showing me that, you know, some of our plans, some of our logic is, is there. We, we understand what we need to do to make these flower systems work out. Um, we just need to keep experimenting. We need to keep trying. So, you know, even though the weather isn't what it, we want it to be even though you know the farm maybe isn't as exciting as abundant as we'd care to share with you guys in an end of may farm tour um it's really exciting to know that it's working and it's going to be there and you know in may's into the future every year it's going to look better and you know by june it's going to be incredible here buddy likes the clover buddy very much likes the clover he lays down in it he is a boss
I think he's hiding it. 